NXT TakeOver War Games. Bringing back the War Games match as well as the Starcade name for a WWE house show is just WWE once again bragging about how cool they are and pissing on the grave of WCW. The President of the United States. Black and white old school footage of a conference with the President of the United States of America is not exactly how I'd hype up NXT. Sure, the word war is involved, but the word games is involved too. We are undisputed. Then why didn't this trio just call themselves Undisputed instead of Undisputed Era? With no roof on the cage, we might as well call this a double steel cage match, despite the ruling against Escape in the Cage. Matchup is brought to you by Butter because of A professional wrestling match is brought to you by Butter? Did I hear that right? And I know how tough this dude is. I Quick question, would wrestlers get disqualified for going into the second ring or counted out? Honestly, what are the rules in this case? He has proven to be a one-man gang. Ha <laughs> ha, I get that reference. <laughs> Little cringe though. Gary Biono and wow! Always impressive to see someone cash his own size perform a kip up like that. Oh. Damn it, that's another sinner move. Right, sir, watch it and now Many brutal and devastating stomps to the head of Lars Sullivan. Can someone remind me why the curb stomp is banned again? And yet somehow a tombstone pile driver fails almost all the time on the first try, but what looks to be your average back suplex is enough to finish off your opponent in a 5 minute match. I guess wrestlers need to utilize these average moves more often, they just might work. It wasn't easy, but Sullivan vanquishes Cassius. Actually, in an only 5 minute match, it was pretty easy for Lars to defeat Cassius. Treating Odo like Apple Software treated the letter I. Like Apple treated the letter I. Uh, okay. Backstage segments with muted microphones. It took Nigel 8 seconds before he realized that the screens were showing the Undisputed Era. Say my name. So, a majority of the reason as to why this match exists between Alistair Black and the Velveteen Dream is because Velveteen is determined to have Alistair say his name? Did I read that right? Anybody Percy this. Guarantee you thought I was about to place a sin because of Velveteen's music sounding like softcore porn music from the 1980s. But what I'm actually going to send is the sad fact about the lack of fans on almost an entire side of the arena. I took one look at what Velveteen is wearing on his chest and I'm severely offended. Not kidding. I think it's obvious why. Spinning heel kick, the black mask is in Skip! Is this the first time I've ever removed a sin for the design on someone's pants? Well, if it is, there's a first for everything. Been a long time since someone was obsessed with his name and people remembering it. Haven't heard something like that since Dolph Ziggler's gimmick of constantly introducing himself nine years ago. Trained by MMA train oh. Holy crap, Alistair's like a freaking snake with that quickness. How awesome was that counter? Rosa tweets. No denying, that was some amazing time and an awesome intimidation from Alistair. Crafting this up, Alistair Black and <sighs> We're just going to turn this into a dick measuring contest using taunts, aren't we? But Never thought I'd see the day where a wrestler would get so pissed off at his opponent just because he's not watching him show off his body. Velveteen is kick-ass in the ring, don't get me wrong, I'm just saying. Let's just piss off the Wrestling Sins guy by forcing him to activate the copyright infringement sin. Why not? Velveteen Dream. WWE thinks that just because I didn't see Alistair do Velveteen's taunt, then the copyright infringement sin won't be activated. And they are wrong. Jesus, that's twice in a row I've done that. And this was Velveteen's best match of his career from what the critics are saying? Guess that's not saying much the way things are looking here. That's what Black did earlier! What? At what point in this match did Alistair pose on the ropes then slide underneath the ropes in that manner? When, Percy? Yeah, the referee's totally going to ask Alistair what Velveteen's name is instead of asking him if he can continue the match. Totally. Percy! How the hell do you expect Alistair to say your name when you got his damn mouth covered? What the my name? At this point, I'm starting to wonder if Velveteen even knows what his name is, and the secret reason to why he keeps asking Alistair and even the referee's name is because he secretly doesn't know himself. Dun dun dun! First into the corner, springboard! Sorry, but Velveteen was already falling back before Alistair could connect with the springboard moonsault. Alright, that'll get a couple sins removed. Not too fond of Velveteen, but that was an awesome Death Valley driver with a cartwheel addition to it. And another two sins removed. I think I now see why this was his best match. He did more than taunt his opponent all the time. Velveteen Dream. Yep, you heard it right. This was all about saying a freaking name. 
two simple words. But hey, it's no big deal, so might as well get it over with, right, Alistair? The NXT Women's Fantastic Four. NXT Women's Fantastic Four? For one thing, these four women are not even in a stable together, and their performances don't suck either. That one moment when Nikki Cross's theme is just a high-pitched and more upbeat version of Sanity's theme. Honestly, was thinking that Alvin and the Chipmunks made this song or something. Finn Balor was the longest reigning male. Haha, <laughs> the cameraman tripped. Or dropped his camera. Either way. It's brought to you by... Skip! Almost everybody said Peyton Royce. Which will make WWE decide to not let that happen, as usual. And speaking of Twitter... Yeah, speaking of Twitter, no one cares what's trending. Who is going to take over the NXT Women's Division? Wah, wah. And Kyrie! Alright, after the many, many sin videos that I put in this statement, it might as well become a cliche now. Wrestler watches opponent for enough length of time to counter or move out of the way, but decides not to cliche. It's same ducks under the clothesline. Oh. We interrupt NXT War Games to bring you Armageddon 2008. With a beautiful break! Technically, Nikki kicked out before Kyrie Sane interfered, especially considering she took all the time of the world to break up the pinfall. With an Alabama slam. Peyton Royce is technically in the cover on Nikki following that Alabama slam, so why the hell isn't the referee counting? Do your job, you idiot! From down on the ready to poise! Both Peyton and Nikki are just standing around, obviously waiting for Ember Moon to do something. Problem for Ember is she takes too long posing on the top rope and makes the standoff look awkward. And our newest! NXT Women's Champion! Newest NXT Women's Champion? That only makes sense if there was a new champion recently. And this is the first time we've seen a new NXT Women's Champion crown since April 2016. So the word newest doesn't make much sense to use in this case. Pretty good idea for Asuka to be the one handing the NXT Women's title over to Ember Moon. One of the few passing of the torch moments that actually didn't piss me off somehow. Back remember was Ember Moon. Okay, now we just got ruined by that second hug. Kevin Owens, this is the most notice that anyone will give me out of these two nights over this weekend face. Why is it that you've been avoiding Andrade? Actually, I guarantee Drew McIntyre completely forgot that Andrade Cien Almas was around here, considering his major downfall over this past year before Brooklyn. Seeing Drew wear a kilt is very appropriate for his heritage, though I wonder why he wasn't wearing it at Brooklyn, especially considering the NYPD pipes and drums were present too. I have one word to describe Drew McIntyre. S-A-W-F-T soft? Hashtag if you want to get in on the conversation. Really? That's the hashtag you're promoting? Hashtag if you want to get in on the conversation? Well, that is just weird. Just don't be a Twitter troglodyte. Don't be a Twitter troglodyte? So basically, you'd rather we spend our time on Twitter during this match instead of being old-fashioned and actually watching the match instead. Well, this sin is me giving you the bird. Hard-hitting affair already. No feeling, no process. You can't do that. What are you talking about, Percy? What Andrade is doing on the ropes is not illegal, so yeah, he can do that. Off he goes! Whoever the hell that random fan was, that randomly shouted what sounded like Happy Birthday. Drew McIntyre maybe- oh. Well, that's what you get when you stomp your foot with your back turned toward your opponent, who clearly got alerted by the stomping. Oh. Nice try, Drew. We all saw you slap the ring post upon jumping in the air. Picture perfect moonsault, especially from the angle of the camera. Great job. Get it! Oh no! Andrade is addicted to Drew's McIntyre's. Oh. Andrade decides to grab Drew's NXT title, likely because he believes he won't win it tonight, and of course to allow Zelina Vega to attack Drew. But still, title theft. Oh. This single move rips the NXT title away from Drew, but the main thing is it nearly rips his arm apart and ends 2017 for him. But I'm still removing five sins because Andrade definitely deserved this title victory after everything he got put through over the years in NXT. Also, ladies and gentlemen, the WWE sins have made history. For the first time ever in a 2017 WWE pay-per-view sins video, the 10 sin penalty has not been activated at all for 10 chance during countouts. Likely because they were barely even a whisper tonight. And it's kind of obvious that there won't be an option for it in the upcoming War Games match, so dock off 10 cents for the end of the 2017 undefeated streak for the 10 cent penalty. Now we're about to bear witness to With the red and blue lights and the siren going off while the cage is lower, now we'll give this another sin remover. Great hype to the War Games match. It's inside separate shark cages. Oh my god, WWE's weird fetish for shark cages continue. Got nothing against pinfalls qualifying in this match, though it does take a lot of the torturous nature out of the War Games match by having that as an option for victory. At least when WCW did it, you win by submission or knockout, 
which gave it more intensity and torture. Roderick Strong is basically like Luke Skywalker when he was wearing a Stormtrooper outfit. I can't see a thing in this helmet. The rest of the team's in their shark cages. I don't know what to send more here. Adam Cole attempting to run away from the competition despite this obviously having no way out, or both Eric Young and Roderick Strong pulling the attack the villain in a 2 on one situation during a triple threat cliche. Decide. We're a minute in. Might as well stall time by standing around. We can't win early on anyway. Oh, oh Adam Cole. Adam Cole is an idiot. Officially Adam, Cole. Adam is addicted to Eric Strong's and Roderick's Young's. Wait, I said that wrong. So Cole, the veteran, just In a triple threat between Adam Cole, Eric Young, and Roderick Strong, Mauro Ranallo lists Adam as the veteran, despite that he first wrestled in 2008. Compare that to Eric debuting in 1998 and Roderick debuting in 2000. How is Adam the veteran in any way compared to the other two? This match is still not official. Except for the fact that the bell rang seven minutes ago. You also can't win the Elimination Chamber until all wrestlers are in the ring. Does that mean the match is not official yet? Or the Royal Rumble isn't official until number 30 enters? Come on, fellas, get some damage done. Nigel's cheerleading. I call bullshit. All the lights were still on Sanity, whereas the main spotlight shut off for the Authors of Pain. It should be Sanity's turn to enter the match. How funny would it have been if Akam and Rizar had pulled Kyle O'Reilly out of the cage and onto the floor outside after opening the door, thus forcing the Undisputed Era to forfeit the match. Missed opportunity for a hilarious moment. And again, not an official match yet! Seriously, shut the hell up with that! That's the fourth time in two minutes that you've reminded us of that. And I know that because I've been watching the countdown clock. The pain! <laughs> and the Bobby Fish didn't even get hit whatsoever when Roderick was thrown into the other wrestlers. Hell, he wasn't even tripped by a fallen wrestler either, making his fall much more unnecessary. And Saturday looks to I am removing five sins for Killian Dane's epic idea of bringing in as many weapons as possible prior to entering the cage. Saturday are the only team oh. Kyle O'Reilly somehow hasn't gotten fined or legit suspended for breaking the rules against chair shots to the head. WWE has a strict policy against that. Well, where's he going? Where else can Bobby go, aside from crashing into the garbage can? Killian fiddling around with a lock on the cage door for about 10 seconds. Key swallowing. But here he is! The key! Wah wah. Killian! Killian is a dick to his own partners. I must admit, the person I was impressed with the most in this War Games match was Killian Dane. The way he perfected a lot of his moves, as well as showing off an insane amount of strength, was a big reason as to why this match was awesome to watch. And then they both ended up going into the opposite rings and missing each other along the way. Alrighty, breaking it up. That wasn't Roderick, that was Kyle who broke up the pinfall with the chain. How can you confuse Kyle with Roddy in any way? Right here. Ah! Where'd he come from? What do you think Eric came from, Percy? But that's the mentality of war games, that's what it It's a good thing that the crowd chanted used the tables because those tables have been lined for gone in the ring for the past 12 minutes. I bet the wrestlers completely forgot they were there. A strike by Roderick Drug. Who the fuck is Roderick Drug? Bacho Ranallo is really on fire here tonight. I try to separate people. Eric rolling over Alexander Wolf and potentially giving him more pain, especially since Alexander is lying on the steel platform connecting the two rings. All nine competitors! Actually, eight, because Adam is not involved in this double German suplex powerbomb combo. It's Adam Cole, baby! Please don't ever say that again, Nigel. Oh! The authors of pain are dicks to Adam's Coles. Mauro has said Mamma Mia way too many times in this match. Constantly repeating catchphrases in one single match is like me constantly repeating the same catchphrase in one sin video. It's annoying. What is this? Well, somebody is obviously a huge fan, no pun intended, of Shane McMahon. Let's hope that didn't alert the wrestlers below me that I'm about to jump. There's Roderick Strong! And now Adam is likely questioning why he constantly yells his name, which gave away his position and alerted Roderick. Off-sync holy shit chance. Way off-sync. Oh, Instead of lifting up the chair to give Adam the leverage he needed to win this match, why didn't Eric throw the chair at Adam, thus countering the knee strike? This match was awesome, but it ends on a stupid decision to block a knee with a freaking steel chair, which makes the pain all the more worse. Adam Cole had the Undisputed Era! Isn't Adam also part of the Undisputed Era? Why announce his name separately from the Undisputed Era as if he's not even part of the stable at all? I find this perfect that when the match ends, literally everyone is lying on the ground as if they were dead. Shows the reality of real life war. 
everybody, even the winners, lying on the ground, dead. And since this match kicked ass along with this ending scene, here's another 15 sins removed. Still on the floor. <laughs> this is quickly becoming one of the most annoying phrases I ever heard in the WWE. Has returned. Whoops, I think we accidentally started playing the first NXT War Games pay-per-view instead of the sequel, because the war returned a year ago. How many times am I gonna have to beat down Kyrie Sane? Aside from one occasion, it was always the other way around when it came to Shayna Baszler versus Kyrie Sane. For War Games 2. Where's the 2 in the logo though? Also, why are we labeling these sequel takeover events but forgetting to label the sequel events for all the other WWE pay-per-views? NXT's version of the Fantastic Four! NXT's version of the Fantastic Four. Not even close. For the NXT's Infinity War. First, Mauro Ranallo says this is NXT's version of Fantastic Four, but then Nigel McGuinness says this is NXT's version of Infinity War. The Fantastic Four was not even in Infinity War. Also, the commentators already used up the Infinity War references when it came to that ladder match in New Orleans earlier this year. You don't just win war games. Impromptu segments and matches on an NXT TakeOver event? I thought NXT knew better than that. I've been proven wrong once again. So, this guy is Matt Riddle, a guy who claims to be the king of bros. Um, Zack Ryder would like to have a word with you. Free sandals, folks! Bro! Bro! Really? Got a ring! We got two rings! Oh my god, how much longer is this promo gonna be? Matt is really trying to take all the time in the world just to say where they are and what they have in the arena. Also, stated the obvious, no shit we have two rings, the event's called War Games. And I'll knock you out in both of them. Matt Riddle ultimately forgets to throw Cassius Ono into the second ring later and knock him out there too. Bro. Seriously, you're making me hate the word bro. Bro. You are too stupid to know you're not supposed to be out here. Cassius Ono would be great at CinemaSense 2 expansion, but then again, you're not supposed to be out here either, so it's a two-way sin. Oh, it's Riddle! I'm sorry, was I supposed to be impressed by that? You could clearly tell that was going to happen the moment Cassius taunted Matt. Also, for every second this random impromptu match existed, here's a sin. We're gonna get back to regularly scheduled programming. In other words, it took 10 minutes for this event to officially begin following the opening video package. Two out of three NXT Women's Championship. Two out of three NXT Women's Championship? So, are Shayna Baszler and Kairi Sane competing for two out of three different versions of the NXT Women's title tonight? That's what it sounds like from Bacho Ranallo's perspective. Seriously, is Kyrie gonna pick which version of her entrance theme she wants to use, or are we just gonna keep going back and forth? That's Baszler Bay. Baszler Bay. Shayna once again channeling her inner Goldberg, coincidentally on the first takeover of 2018 and the final takeover of 2018. There are 206 bones in an adult human skeleton. Well, thank you for the school lesson, Marl. I was totally wondering how many bones were in an adult human skeleton. Baszler! Early on in this match, do you really want to march away from Shayna? Bad strategy, Kyrie. <laughs> Wait a second. Nigel could see Marina Shafira and Jessamine Duke arrive before the cameras could even pick it up. And the commentators are on the far side of the second ring, away from where the action is located. So even if they were not looking at their monitors, they still wouldn't be able to see them coming. No! The annoying ass kissing commentary of Percy Watson. Oh, for... Kyrie clearly kicked out twice, and it's only the second time where the referee actually realizes it. What an idiot. No one cares what's trending. So I don't think we'll see a submission victory out of this. You never know, Nigel. A submission could occur at this moment, even if it obviously doesn't. I'm just saying, submissions could happen at any time. Baszler, the former mixed martial artist! Thanks for the random reminder that Shayna Baszler is a former mixed martial artist, something we've known for the longest time by now. She's enjoying the punishment she's inflicting. No shit, Sherlock. And oh! Wow, Shayna said before that she was going to kick Kyrie's ass, and it looks like she lived up to her promise. She literally kicked her ass. These are some of the slowest punch throwing I have ever seen. It looks like drunk punches to me. Shayna clearly leaped over the top rope on her own accord, whereas Kyrie had nothing to do with it despite pulling the rope down. Here comes the first of what is likely many center movers tonight. That DDT on the apron was brutal. A single spinning punch to the arm and Shayna is knocked unconscious. I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound believable to me considering the way Shayna competes. Somebody's gotta do something about this stuff. As much as Percy's whining irritates me, I gotta agree with him on this. The referee is not doing the one thing that he should be doing, kicking out Jessamine and Marina. 
Sorry, Mara, but you should really save the Mamma Mia catchphrase for the most epic moments rather than constantly shouting it multiple times in one match. If I were Kyrie, I would have done a little more damage on Shayna before going for the elbow drop again, because Shayna had many minutes to recover. I call bullshit on the victory, considering Kyrie's shoulder came off the mat not once, but twice. So that's a double sin there. Hey look, it's the guy who called me out with so much ignorance on knowledge about how the sins concept works. I mean, hey look, it's X-Pac! The fact that Tommaso Ciampa committed vandalism and got away with it. Look into my eyes. You'll know your answer. Did people really believe that Johnny Gargano didn't assault Aleister Black just because he told William Regal to look into his eyes? Because that basically just gave it away. I'm the hero at the end of this story. You are never a hero because a hero actually wins the war in the end. Something you have yet to accomplish. Dropping valuable technology equipment. What a dick. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. Well, if Johnny Gargano believed that he didn't do anything wrong, then why did he hide from the reveal that he attacked Alistair? The answer? He obviously knows what he did was wrong and is lying to himself and everyone else. Again. For more games is presented by- Skip! Those horns on Alistair's jacket makes an epic addition to his look and entrance. That's another sin off. Record! 11th takeover! I would be impressed that Johnny Gargano is appearing at his 11th NXT TakeOver event, but his win-loss record doesn't exactly help this. Most people chant fight, fight, fight because they want to see two guys fighting and think it's awesome. I chant fight, fight, fight because I'm tired of seeing anything but physicality in the ring. Oh, he's gone down. What an idiot. From Gargano. What in the freaking hell was that supposed to be? Oh my lord, that was embarrassing. Force punches are not exactly cool to see. Copyright infringement. Whoa! Alistair could clearly see Johnny running around the ring to the other side and didn't once think that he would be attacked from behind again. And after Johnny had already assaulted him from behind months ago. And physically into this Alistair reacted a little too late from that stomp. Oh. Stomp at the ring canvas apparently caused Alistair's head to hurt even more. Did turning to the dark side cause Johnny to gain magical powers or something? Johnny Gargano feeling himself. Ha! <laughs> Giggity! Whoa! Johnny's arm is definitely in a lot of pain after that, but let's be thankful that Alistair missed the rest of him, am I right? Points of his lip! Oh! It's extremely impressive to see Alistair flip like that, and I want to remove sins, but the problem is he keeps missing his target. This is very personal! At this point, pretty much every match on an NXT TakeOver is personal. Hell, we should label a future event NXT TakeOver Personal, with extreme stipulations on every match. Holy crap, I just came up with an epic idea! Johnny Gargano that sends Gargano! Johnny Gargano that sends Gargano? Bacho Ranallo is on fire tonight. Tope! There we go. Now we're picking up on some awesome moments in this match. Let's deduct two sins for that moment. You're not the chosen one! Well, this clearly proves that Johnny is not the hero in this story, because the hero doesn't monologue when his opponent is in position to be finished off. You can't get the job done, Alex! Coming from the guy who has lost 85% of his matches throughout his 11 NXT TakeOver appearances. 13,000! Commentator states the number of fans in attendance as though we even care a cliche. I've been doing this job for nearly five years and I stopped caring four and a half years ago. Johnny is now on the apron connecting the two rings together, but I'm gonna ask something that I think I asked in last year's NXT Wargame Sins video. What would happen if either of these two suddenly went into the other ring? Would the match continue on that side? Oh, <laughs> Quit stalling time! Johnny honestly deserves three sins for slowly lifting up Alistair, taunting him, and then posing for the fans before actually trying to win the match. I'm starting to think he loses his matches on purpose. Johnny actually falls for that. No surprise there. You might as well rename him Gullible Gargano, or GG for short. If you constantly taunt your opponent when you have the chance to finish him off instead of finishing him off, you deserve to lose. And people ask why I don't like Johnny Gargano. Jesus, that's three sins removed for more intense brutality. Perfectly timed me for my view. Begging for mercy. Johnny Gargano and his apparent foot fetish. Also, this is just further humiliating himself too, so skip. I'm tired, let me use your boobs as a pillow. Good night, Alistair. First he mimics the real American Hulk Hogan at NXT Chicago 2, and now Velveteen Dream mimics the NWO Hulk Hogan at NXT War Games 2. Point is, Velveteen is a ripoff. Is that you, Taz? Title hugging. Rest so please. Rest so please. Rest so please. Seriously, the last match gave me a headache with a staring. Like that, he's gotta keep his eyes on the prize. Percy Watson would be great at Cinemasons to expansion. <laughs> Is Velveteen Dream seriously getting offended or shocked that Tommaso Ciampa stole his headband? Like, it's just a headband. You probably got thousands of them. What's losing one going to do to you? Also, this scene involving Tommaso taunting Velveteen with his headband goes on for quite some time. Excuse me, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Let me know if they stop playing around and actually start wrestling. 
Title theft. So this is what it's come down to. A battle between two thefts of the other's belongings. Really? Wow, dream! Tommaso was already starting to fall before Velveteen could even connect the double axe handle. The first five minutes of this 20 minute match is either a battle of thievery, taunts, or poses to the crowd, with hardly any wrestling. It gets better later, but it should really be good from the first bell to the end bell. Stop taunting the audience and win the NXT Championship, you sexy moron! Good lord. Should have hit the leg drop when you had the chance, dumbass. Gosh darn it, it seemed that the 10 chance during countouts had been long forgotten, but as usual, I get hit with a dose of reality. And the reality is, the infection is still here. Champ oh. Tommaso's punch is strong with a force. Circle. Oh. And remember He's that! Out. That knee knocked out Velveteen and Tommaso has the chance to retain his NXT Championship, but instead of doing that, he stands there doing absolutely nothing, giving Velveteen precious time to wake up and recover. Cover him! Nigel McGuinness would be great at Sunmissions to expansion, even if he was cheerleading Tommaso. What do you think you're doing, stupid dumbass? Now he's in no rush to finish this match! And he may live to regret that. I'm the main event! Unfortunately, tonight you are not the main event, considering you are not a participant in the upcoming War Games match. Any other time when you're in the main event, that catchphrase would make sense. Remember, he is Ew. Tommaso Ciampa. Okay, this is something I've been meaning to ask for a long time. What is the true pronunciation of this name? Is the first name pronounced Tommaso or Tommaso? And the last name, is it really Ciampa or Champa? Like seriously, I keep hearing so many renditions of both his names to the point where I don't even know which is the real one anymore. Two successful leg drops, but sadly the third one missed Tommaso completely. I guess Velveteen didn't get a successful hat trick. Don't feel bad, the Los Angeles Kings couldn't get the job done either. Another case of begging for mercy. Coincidentally, it was Tommaso's former partner Johnny Gargano who last did that in this video. Well, that's gotta suck. Bet you wish you had the hold locked in while you were in the ring. And to all who say that Velveteen should have won, do you not understand that Velveteen was out of freaking bounds? Study up on your knowledge of the rules before you say who should have won. I don't know what the hell I just saw, but I'm removing another three sins for that. Holy crap, this is awesome. You're disgusting, Tommaso. We don't want to see Velveteen's ass. That had to be super awkward for the referee getting a full moon while noticing Tommaso was pulling the tights. Heel champion attempts to leave slash use the champion's advantage to get himself counted out or disqualified and retain his title cliche. And in a great match like this one, we don't have time for that crap. The referee clearly saw Velveteen use the NXT Championship on Tommaso and didn't call for the disqualification for whatever reason. Do your job! Tearing up the ring mats has become a fetish for Tommaso at this point in his career. This is what the sick SOB deserves! God. Well, that's what you deserve for calling Tommaso a sick SOB and saying he deserves everything Velveteen is dishing out to him instead of calling the match down the middle like a commentator is supposed to. This likely didn't affect Tommaso that much because Velveteen hit the Dreamer Driver on some extra padding. Should have done it on the concrete to make it more epic. <laughs> Screw it, here's 10 sins removed because this match is so freaking awesome and full of unpredictability. Removing another sin for this song because those double bass kicks are awesome and this song is awesome. Reminds me of my days with my former band. Escape or leave the cage? Just like I said last year, why can't we have a roof on the cage like the original War Games match in WCW? Or have the match only end by submission to make it more interesting? Because I still believe that winning a War Games match by pinfall is such a cheap and easy victory. With Adam Cole competing first, so I guess we interrupt NXT War Games 2 to bring you the first NXT War Games. I would have removed a sin, maybe even two, if either Hanson or Rose suddenly grabbed Bobby Fish's arm and started yanking him against the shark cage. That would have been hilarious. Well, considering Roderick Strong was an honorary member of the Authors of Pain during last year's War Games match, I guess it's only fitting that Pete Dunne and Ricochet are honorary members of the War Raiders in this year's War Games match. I wonder what may happen if we do this again next year. And again, this is not the official War Games match. We know, Mauro. It's been explained many times already in the last five minutes. Let's the bell rang before the referee could even signal for it to ring. This is ironic to the saying, this is my ring, because in this case, both Ricochet and Adam Cole have a ring to themselves. The NXT Adam. Skywalker. NXT Skywalker. The lion's still facing off. Ricochet didn't even shove Adam at all, who decided to throw himself into the ropes for whatever reason. Man who has no fear. This wrestler competing has no fear, cliche. If you're a high flyer, I think it's pretty obvious that you don't have any fear of risk taken in the ring. It will be. 
The rule is obviously stated earlier that only one member of each team can be released at each interval. If the entire Undisputed Era actually thought that they could all enter at the same time, they're a bunch of morons. With more chemistry than a science fair. <laughs> more chemistry than a science fair? Maro has got some weird comparisons here. Then done. Whoa. Hansen is addicted to Pete Dunn. Also, considering the fact that Pete was the closest to the cage door, shouldn't he be the one who exits first? He was first in line, so that's the way I see it. Also, also, are you telling me that this team didn't devise a strategy on who gets to enter with each turn? If I were them, I would have done that instead of winging it. I laughed so much when Hansen kept running and yelling to both Adam and Kyle O'Reilly. Here's a sin-off for the hilarious comedy of this match. Hansen teaming up! Haha, <laughs> <laughs> Ricochet accidentally kicked Hansen on the way down. Again, no pinfalls or submissions! Please, Mauro, stop it. We know how the rules of this War Games match goes, and we hadn't heard a stating of the obvious when it came to the match rules all night long until this one. And it's gonna be one! Roderick Strong is a dick to his own pendant. Strong! With a strong effort! Wah, wah. How's it feel? I don't know how it feels to be Ricochet right now, but I know that it feels horrible to see constant taunting instead of chaos. And by the way, War Games yet to officially begin. Do I seriously have to create a bonus round of the many times that Mauro states that the War Games match has yet to officially begin? Does he think we're stupid and not know how to read the rules? Teamwork makes the dream work! No one likes a rhymer, Morrow. Somewhere, Daniel Bryan just got a look of jealousy next to his new sinister grin after seeing Roe hit the running knee on Adam. Well, it would have been face first if Adam actually did hit his face out the cage. It was actually hands first. Ah. If I'm being honest, I think the entire broadcast of this War Games match should only take place with this camera since it has the perfect view of both wrestling rings and it destroys the chance of missing some potential epic action. Must. Lock. Pete Dunne. Into the cage. So that we can have an excuse to make this match go on longer than it really should be going. Gotta pad the runtime to near 50 minutes somehow, so let's waste the next 8 minutes focusing on Pete trying to get out of the cage. Also, Bobby does realize that the match can't begin unless Pete is inside, right? So, does this mean the Undisputed Era intended to keep this War Games fight going on forever with no intentions of actually starting the match? Also, also, how would this strategy work? If they leave the cage over the top, they'd automatically lose and they can't win unless Pete is in the cage too. This strategy is full of flaws and is a lose-lose situation if you think about it. Their logic sucks. The more I see the referees not trying to stop Bobby Fish from locking in Pete, the more I cringe. Like seriously, he's not gonna listen to you if you just yell at him. Try to actually get him away from the cage, dumbasses. He's got the key! You know the referee should really consider getting spare keys just on the very case that a situation like this occurs. <laughs> the fact that the Undisputed Era took time off their hands to spray paint their logo on four chairs is weird as hell. Better yet, focus the action only using this camera. What's so wrong with that? It doesn't officially start! Kyle using the chair as an air guitar. My key doesn't work on this one! Once again, you ever consider the idea of spare keys or leave some bolt cutters on standby just on the very case that something like this happens? Idiots. <laughs> Will somebody please smash him against the cage so we can stop saying that all the time? <laughs> Both Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly clearly saw Pete Dunn grab a kendo stick and didn't once consider the possibility that their hands would get attacked. Wait a second! <laughs> That was the most embarrassing candlestick shot to someone's hand if I ever seen one before. That stick was nowhere near Adam's hand and yet it somehow hurt him. This really is feeling more like last year's War Games event. And if the wrestlers are gonna throw weapons into the ring, why couldn't we just have the cage already loaded with weapons before the match began just to save the trouble of throwing them all in? Whoever the hell that was that said alright hit me. We're in the middle of a War Games match, no time to tell us what the obvious number one trend worldwide is. Besides, we already seen that four times tonight. Where the hell did Pete Dunne find a damn chain? He clearly didn't take the chains that were locking him at the shark cage, nor did he pull a chain from underneath the ring either. We got a real mystery on our hands, folks. Someone is potentially getting annihilated by a kendo stick, but we're just gonna focus on Pete trying to rip Kyle's fingers off instead. Can we get another view from the overhead shot, please, so that we don't miss any more action? Are we sure we're not watching the first NXT War Games event? Because I'm seeing so many references to that show in this match. So much deja vu. What the? Just that. Hansen was slammed ass first onto the steel floor, and while he did land on Kyle O'Reilly, his ass hit the steel floor first, and thus logically it should have taken the most damage. Then again, this is the WWE where logic doesn't seem to exist apparently. And again, War Raider. Bad Hansen. The fans are likely chanting for the tables because all the wrestlers in the cage have likely forgotten about it at this point in the match. He just got the better of Ow, my hands! 
Oh, Pete Dunn! And remember, Kyle can't even wrap the chain around Pete's foot. This goes on for quite some time. I guess it wouldn't be a War Games match without one pair of wrestlers trying to replicate what another pair are doing on the other ring. No fair, Ricochet had a head start. What do you bet Hansen was thinking, oh yeah, we've had tables inside the cage for the last 15 minutes. Why didn't we think of using them earlier? <laughs> Hansen can't even set up tables properly. Reminds me of that one time when The Miz failed to set up a table for Randy Orton eight years ago. The first team to score a pinfall. <sighs> All eight superstars struggling. Actually, from the looks of things, only Adam is struggling. Everyone else is either knocked out or barely stirring. Adam does remember what happened last year, right? He climbed to the top of the cage and got superplexed for his troubles as a result. Does he honestly think that climbing to the top of the cage once again is going to help his case? I guess some people don't learn from their mistakes. Tell me I'm a liar! You're a liar. What? He told me to call him a liar. What did you think I was going to do? Okay, that was a little cool. Here are a few sins after that. Ricochet's double moonsault was no doubt an epic and surprising moment, and I'm throwing away another 15 cents for his determination to make an epic moment. And mission accomplished. Although, I'm adding in a Sid because he sadly only hit 20% of the competition in that exchange, whereas everybody else just fell down for the joy of falling down. After all they've been through, and they're still standing. Got a lot of respect for all eight of these competitors, so here's another eight sins remove. Respect well deserved. Yep. <laughs> Whatever the hell that was supposed to be. Wow, anytime someone of that size does something like that, my jaw drops in absolute amazement. Here's another three cents off. The ending of this match is a really hilarious sight considering Pete is exhausted and rests his head on Adam's coals. WWE presents NXT TakeOver, uh... War Games 3, or is it Chicago 3, or perhaps a combination of both? Also, this honestly makes me think about what will happen if NXT TakeOver returns to Chicago for a fourth time. If this event is labeled War Games 3, while also taking place in Chicago, does that mean the next TakeOver in Chicago will be labeled Chicago 3 or Chicago 4? If it's the first guess, that'll definitely be bullshit. Under banners of black and gold. Narration, also stating the obvious. No shit that is Shawn Michaels narrating this opening promo to the third NXT War Games event. The war is inevitable. And I am Christian freaking Miracle. War Games! As cool as it is to hear the announcement for a War Games match, the cool feeling is kind of ruined by the fact that we already knew there was a War Games event. Now, if William Regal suddenly announced a War Games match for the NXT TakeOver during WrestleMania weekend, then we definitely lose our shit more than we did here. Little boys moved in. Uh, yeah, that's what happens when someone moves out. New people move in. What, was Finn Balor expecting NXT to be completely empty when he left for the main roster in 2016? Sacrifice meets opportunity. That would only be the case if every member of the Undisputed Era were defending their titles inside the War Games match, which they're not. Would be a very interesting concept if they did, though. Guess we got another missed opportunity. Anyone notice that smoke machine right there? Well, sadly, a lot of the fans were blinded by the smoke throughout the night and couldn't see the matches. Honestly, feel really bad for those fans. Whoever thought it was a good idea to have a smoke machine in the freaking crowd deserves these 10 sins. Hey, I think I see myself in the- Oh, wait, I'm blocked once again thanks to the damn smoke. Wow, WWE hates me. No surprise there. Baby Yoda memes! Baby Yoda memes. That's only a sin because this event does not feature that adorable little guy. The history that we're gonna see here tonight. That's right, history will happen- Nigel McGuinness doesn't realize that Beth Phoenix already declared that history will be made tonight. Pay attention, dumbass. Oh, by the way, history will be made tonight. What Chuck D said, welcome to the first women's war games. When the hell did Chuck D ever say welcome to the first women's war games match? The cage hasn't even lowered yet and Bacho Ranallo has already begun. Also, can we please put the damn roof back on the cage already? I'm just saying, WCW had the best war games simply because of the closed space and submission only rules. I wish they all could be Californian! Coming from someone who's British. Also, Nigel McGuinness believes that Candice LeRae is beautiful and extremely talented simply because of the fact that she's from California. Ouch to anybody who's not from California then. Kaylee Ray, our NXT Women's Champion, UK Champion! Wait, hold up a second. Since when did Kaylee Ray ever win the NXT Women's Championship? Especially since she wasn't even in WWE by the time Shayna Baszler's second title reign began. I guess even NXT has had its moments in Appleton. Rhea Ripley rejected Dakota Kai to be a part of her team. Mia Yim, the one who was picked over her, was coincidentally taken out of the equation. 
How in the living fuck did no one even think about the possibility that Dakota was harnessing any vendettas against the team? Like, seriously, it was completely obvious that Dakota was responsible even before the big reveal, which lost a lot of credit because of these facts. Shayna Baszler discusses with her team about who will start the match, and Io Shirai just walks to the ring, not even giving a shit. Looks like Dakota Kai isn't the only one we should keep a close eye on. Members of Team Blazler and... Team Blazler. Yep, you heard that right. Looks like we're in for another round just like the NXT Toronto 2 sins. This is about beating the hell out of each other! As if the War Games match was not about beating the hell out of each other throughout the years. All in favor of WWE deciding to keep this camera view shown for the entire match just so we can actually see the complete action throughout, say aye. All members of the teams are in the- Whether Io Shirai countered or not, I highly doubt Candice LeRae would have been able to dive through both sets of ring ropes considering they have quite a distance from each other. The genius of the sky! Io Shirai does that to pay tribute to Rey Mysterio 619, but since Candice was facing the other way, I guess we could say that Io paid tribute to the 916. Usually I say the double for the 3619 numbers is 12218. Since it was another 916, I suppose we could say EO has delivered an 18212. These two competitors truly hate each other. Wow, you think? To use the, cage like a cheese grater. the only way EO would be using the cage like a cheese grater is if she was literally grating Candace's face against it. Here she's just pressing Candace's face against the cage. She just got caught. The fans and their stupid Royal Rumble countdowns. I would think that the huge NXT fan base would have more respect for what's going on in the ring. Not to mention, they did this after the clock disappeared from the Titan Tron. Here's another 10 cents because I'm reminded of that god awful Iron Man match at Extreme Rules last year being ruined thanks to their stupidity. Like this. How do you prepare for and now the fans are chanting, Where's the clock? Further proving that they'd rather watch the clock on the screen compared to watching the matches being performed in front of them. Are they seriously that bored? Fighting. Rhea Ripley and her team are pushing against the cage door. Did they forget that Shayna Baszler's team won the right to enter next after the match begins? The Fresh Princess Belair! Why am I not surprised? Bianca Belair's nickname is the Fresh Princess Belair. Guaranteed nobody can be named Belair without someone making a Fresh Prince joke. Oh, what a I just says that's it, implying that Bianca can pin Candice right now and end the match. He completely forgot that the War Games match doesn't officially begin until every member of both teams are present in the match. This goes on for quite some time. Since 100% of the NXT War Games matches have had wrestlers tossing weapons into the ring, why don't we just automatically have weapons put into the ring before the match even begins? What else is under that ring? How would you not know, Beth? Didn't you used to wrestle yourself? Musical chairs come into play anytime there are many chairs involved in the match cliche. Hey, might as well be a cliche by this point. Apparently 10 chairs isn't enough. We need 15. Sorry to make a Jaws reference, but they're gonna need a bigger cage. And quite possibly a third ring. Also, why is the referee arguing with Kaylee Ray? There's no rules against the usage of weapons inside the War Games match. Not to mention, there's no rule with wrestlers immediately going into the ring upon getting released from the shark cage. Is the numbers advantage helping? Kaylee Ray senses the presence of the WWE center in the audience and wants to prevent any chance at a center mover for this video. And so far, the strategy is working, but for how long? <laughs> Would have been a lot cooler if the chairs were still stacked in the musical chairs position, and it would have been worth a center mover too. Guess whose fault this is? <laughs> Bianca Belair barely connected the 450 splash, but likely did this because she wasn't a part of the powerbomb electric chair combination and wanted to fall on chairs for no reason. Here comes Dakota! Dakota Kai exits the shark cage, and the moment the referee continues to hold the door open instead of immediately closing it, you just know something's gonna happen. She didn't want that! Bet Rhea Ripley feels like an idiot now, doesn't she? Rejected Dakota in favor of Mia Yim, Mia is coincidentally assaulted, and Dakota just happened to be around. I honestly would have said, take a hike, it was obviously you. What the hell has happened to Dakota Kai? Maro Ranallo somehow hasn't seen NXT despite being the play-by-play -play commentator for the show. Wow. This is Dakota Kai attacked William Regal and somehow didn't get fired for putting her hands on an authority figure. I guess literally anyone can do that nowadays and get away with it. Shayna Baszler is spending way too much time slowly walking to the ring. Sure, it's a 4 on 2 advantage for her team, but she still shouldn't underestimate Rhea Ripley. No one should. Oh. Why would you cut away at the one moment where Shayna connects a brutal knee to Rhea? We can cut to an injured Tegan Knox afterwards. The double cage of carnage. Both Kaylee Ray and Io Shirai were watching Candice LeRae the entire time and could have attacked her before she whacked him with a trash can lid. Hell, Candice had enough time to walk through the ropes first without being attacked somehow. Oh, Baszler looking for her. 
That's not Shayna Baszler, that is clearly Rhea Ripley. Looks like all three commentators have been botching and we're only on the first match. That's superhuman strength. <laughs> no, Nigel. <laughs> Bianca Belair leaped into the air before she got lashed with a chair. Uh, I mean a kendo stick. Damn it, I got stuck in rhyme mode for a moment. <laughs> I know, right? She missed. Every single person in this arena is on their feet. Not exactly, Beth. Look again. A majority of the fans are sitting down, specifically the ones at ringside. Plus, I was there. Everybody sat back down after Io's missed moonsault. Wrestler handcuffs themselves to their opponent in order to scare them and ultimately win the match, cliche. Outnumbered 4-2 to two and still gaining the victory in the end. Gotta give major props to Rhea Ripley. Without a doubt, she is a force to be reckoned with. Alicia Taylor announces Killian Dane as Damian Priest's only opponent, completely leaving out Pete Dunne. Guess who coincidentally wins the match as a result? Mr. McKinnis. Um, no. Everyone already knows how a triple threat match works. Not to mention, we don't need another Michael Cole around here annoying us with the rules. Also, the way Marl said McGinnis. No disqualifications. <sighs> oh my god. Quick and watch Cole get them tonight's main event. It looks like they. Damien misses a kick, Killian misses a kick, Pete misses a kick, and now it's back to staring. But Pete has the advantage because he's the only one who did a crazy flip before then. Oh, Killian! Damien Priest was already backflipping out of the ring on his own accord before Killian could even connect the clothesline. Fingers again of Killian! Killian Dane clearly submitted and yet this match is continuing. The referee even saw it too, but decided to ignore it. What an idiot. With a full head of steam! Oh. With how slow Damien was in ascending the ropes, you just knew he was going to be countered by Pete. If he was a little faster, he could have successfully attacked Killian before Pete countered. Dane, of course, no. Ow, my hand! Remember pinfall or submission? This match is only three minutes long and we've heard the rules of this triple threat match like four times already. I would have expected that from the main roster, not NXT. Oh, come on. The Bruiserweight and... Ring around the Rosie. <laughs> oh, the, bro the way Killian Dane sat up and prepared to catch Pete Dunne honestly made this moment a little cringe to see. Ah, oh, <laughs> the table didn't break. It seems that after all these years, the Spanish commentators finally had enough and put a lot of reinforcements on their table. That would have been a cool moment had the barricade not been way too easy to knock over. Sorry, but it is what it is. Not to mention, Killian also missed Damien completely in that cannonball attempt. He pretty much knocked over the barricade himself, and Damien only fell back because of gravity. Can you used to feel that in the back? <laughs> what the hell was up with Pete Dunn right there? Chases after Damien and then collapses? Was he too tired to carry on or something? What would that Press a moonsault to Damian Priest, and just Damian Priest, because Killian did not get hit whatsoever. This match is 20 minutes long because of this. Or Dane, John lands on his feet, but then not gonna lie, that counter was actually pretty cool. Just when Pete thinks he's out of harm's way, in comes Killian. Or Damian gets flattened more than a New Day pancake at the last minute of this match. It's both sad and hilarious to think about. I'm gonna expose you. For what? Seriously, what would Matt Riddle be exposed for if Finn Balor wins this match? It honestly doesn't make any sense if you think about it. And in an official capacity! Ha! Ah, nice move by Finn Balor to completely cover the audience in darkness so that they no longer take part in his arm raising motions. Loving the detail of the entrance. See, now he calls it a jump. Oh. Can't stop laughing at Matt Riddle's bare feet slipping off of Finn Balor when he raised them in the air like that. Another reason added to the long list of reasons why wrestling barefoot in the WWE is a bad idea. More NXT TakeOver appearances than anyone else, but- Don't forget more NXT TakeOver losses than anyone else at the same time if you're talking about Johnny Gargano! To his former stomping ground! Wah, wah. As now, Matt Riddle, Carolyn- I may not be a fan of Matt Riddle, but I do admire his amazing strength of the gut wrench suplexes he connects on Finn without letting go. Amazing. Got your nose! Careful, Fang, you have a lot of experience in countering heels who waste time posing before hitting their next move. So why the hell are you also making that same mistake? You can clearly see that Finn successfully connected the Pele kick before Matt grabbed his leg to counter. So why isn't Matt knocked over? Talk about no selling. All is fair in love and NXT TakeOver War Games. I'm gonna try and say this in the most respectful way I can. The constant references are very cringe. All is fair in love and NXT TakeOver War Games? Good lord. You know Matt Riddle. Oh wait, no, no, no. no, just freaking no. Finn Balor spent about two minutes in an ankle lock, which did considerable damage to him. 
His ankle even gave out at one point just by walking, but now all of a sudden Finn can put all the weight on that leg and run with no problems, not to mention the jumping? Please don't be the Seth Rollins of selling injuries in NXT. Wait, come on, has CM Punk chance. Fuck you. Is he able to get it? No, no. More proof that Finn Balor is no selling his ankle injury. Connects the coup de grace on the ring canvas with full force and somehow hasn't collapsed due to the immense pain he's supposed to be in. We're in Rosemont, you idiots. Get it right. Rosemont is quite a distance away from the city of Chicago. I remember. The Allstate Arena is at a distance where the city is as far as the eye can see. Hashtag respect for Rosemont. Weird and awkward fact. The Undisputed Era lost in last year's War Games match and also lost in this upcoming match. Likely because Roderick Strong is with them. Roderick is the only wrestler to have competed and lost in every single NXT War Games match for the males. Undisputed Era's only victory was in 2017 when Roderick was on the opposite side. If the group is in next year's War Games, I highly recommend kicking Roderick to the curb. War Games happens now. Well, technically, War Games is going to happen after this upcoming promo, entrances, and ring introductions. So, in reality, War Games happens in about 15 minutes. What's funny and awkward about this is the camera is given many good cinematic shots of the War Games cage, and no one can see them because of the rules put all over the screen. Jesus, who would have thought that the sight of the Undisputed Era doing their signature poses, all with championships around their waist, would look so... EPIC! They are loyal to the soil! No one likes our rhymer, Maro. Holy shit, that mask Tommaso Ciampa is wearing is actually pretty badass. Now that's how you make a kick-ass entrance for a War Games match. Roderick Strong taking over a minute to debate about whether or not he really wanted to start this match against Tommaso Ciampa. Tommaso willingly offers his own crutch to an enemy. That's a very bad idea, man. Oh, Strong said I don't need this! Considering that crutch came in with Tommaso, does that mean Team Ciampa automatically forfeits due to the crutch escape in the cage? LOL. Also, that was even more stupid than Tommaso willingly handing over his own weapon. Roderick tosses the crutch out of the cage and turns his back on his opponent at the same time. Talk about the Haha, the cameraman accidentally hit the shark cage. Come on, Bacho Ranallo, we even saw it in close-up. What Tommaso connected was clearly a knee to Roderick, not a kick. I like a light, hey, like a light! Oh, for God's sake. Every three minutes, another member- Yes, yes, we know. We saw the rules on the screen literally twice tonight. I think we're all clear on how this match works. Hey, Dude, that's good tear advice! Each other apart. Bobby Fish mocking advice to breathe as if that is bad advice. Worst advice would be to hold your breath. What you got against breathing, man? We have this Let's do the only three. Did Dominic Dijakovic just refer to Tommaso Ciampa as T-Fight or something? I suppose that's gonna be Tommaso's new nickname? Psycho Killer is better. Against the New Day and the Viking Warriors. Either this is another bad case of Bacho Ranallo or the Viking Raiders have gone through yet another crazy ass name change. Don't seem to remember them being called Viking Warriors at all, not even outside WWE. Viking Warriors, that'll be strong. Wow, two botches in a row. Bacho forgot that Roderick Strong is actually competing against AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura at Survivor Series, not in the Tag Team Champions match. Oh, he has two massive teammates. Hard to bask in Keith Lee's glory when he is locked in a shark cage. Sitting in the audience, I was legitimately confused on why the crowd was suddenly bored and randomly chanted for Keith. At his size, it will Shockingly enough, this isn't the first time Kyle O'Reilly believed he could fly. Sorry that I didn't just play the song instead. Maybe he knows something when it comes to the fourth member. Wouldn't every member of Tommaso Ciampa's team know who the final mysterious partner is considering they're on the same side? Oh right, he's out on his feet! That unnecessary roll by Roderick Strong after taking a single super kick. Talk about overreacting. Kyle O'Reilly has completely forgotten that the War Games match hasn't officially started yet since teammates are still absent from the cage. Tommaso Ciampa. Gotta admit, Dominic bouncing Kyle off the ropes just to punch him repeatedly was a hilarious moment of this match. Which means your services are no longer necessary. Bye bye, Bebe. Oh god, that was just awful. Feast your eyes. And feast your eyes on this copyright infringement sin. Bask in all of its glory because daddy's home. Wait, fuck, I'm starting to lose it on here. Oh. Can we all agree that the athleticism of Keith Lee is outstanding? Hi, you hit the cameraman who, by the way, is sitting on a chair that was put there before the match began. I'm honestly surprised none of the wrestlers tried to grab that chair to use as a weapon. Is about to set the table. Should have seen that coming. Table puns! Table puns! Of course! Cringe references and cringe puns! Are you not entertained? Undisputed Era is right on the same page! Oh my god, that is without a doubt one of the biggest stating of the obvious moments I have ever heard. Beth Phoenix saying that Undisputed Era are all on the same page? No shit! 
Table overdose addiction. By this point, it's been well over three minutes since Adam Cole was released, so why hasn't the 10 second countdown appeared by now? What the Bobby Fish is addicted to Keith Lee's. Damn it, Kevin Owens, are you in the bathroom or something? You're literally up next. Get your ass out here. <laughs> Chills, man. Chills. No way out! Well, technically there is a way out since there's no roof at the top of the cage, something it should have. Using the term no way out when there's clearly a way out makes it feel less intense. Stunner by Owens! What in the freaking hell was with that stupid pose by Adam Cole when he got the stunner and fell over? Damn it, guys, that would have looked kick ass if you didn't throw Roderick in the air too early. Good thing he goes through the ropes, but as a result, he misses the Undisputed Era completely. Oh, wow, Kevin Owens. What? Oh my god, Bacho Ranallo really is on fire tonight, isn't he? He looks at Keith Lee climbing the ropes and automatically assumes he's Kevin Owens. Confusing those two apart is next to impossible to do. By Adam, Cole. Adam Cole is the one trying to connect the move, not counter it. Kevin Owens. I remember hearing that crunching noise from my seat in this arena and cringed in pain so bad, I just knew that I was going to remove three cents for it. And here we are! Who the hell is Krong? So many great moments, so many epic moments, and a completely chaotic way to culminate the War Games match in this pay-per-view event. Hats off to all eight of these wrestlers. Considering this is the fourth edition of the NXT TakeOver War Games series, I guess we're gonna call this NXT TakeOver Four Games. Also, with this event taking place in the WWE Performance Center due to the pandemic, this definitely has got to feel like the most claustrophobic War Games event of all time. Very interesting how we are seeing the War Games cage instead of the opening video package. It's as if NXT is telling us, forget about all that, pay attention to the cage because that's all you need. And if that's all we need, then why bother with a video? Damn, now we can't even see anything. Whoever's operating the smoke machines, just remember that we're in a much smaller venue compared to the last three years. Sorry, Vic Joseph, but only William Regal can deliver war games in the most dramatic and chilling way ever. Once all competitors Guy in the production backstage was probably like, whoops, sorry, I didn't realize she was introducing the match. Here's the instructions on the screen. Technically, rule number four officially states that the war games itself cannot really begin until all competitors are in the cage. While Dakota Kai has an awesome pose, Raquel Gonzalez is determined that everyone gets a close-up of her back. I have the most intimidating back in the world. Fear me! What about each member of Team Candice LeRae is cautious about Dakota Kai after what she did at last year's war games pay-per-view? I would. Well, damn, Ember Moon's outfit looked absolutely badass in the dark. It's very good to see her back in NXT again. With how much larger Shotzi Blackheart's tank gets with each pay-per-view event, I'm already calling it now that she will drive a full-size tank like Rusev at her first WrestleMania event. You first heard it here, folks. Also, given the small amount of space in the arena, I'm not sure driving a bigger tank is a good idea on the part of Shotzi Blackheart. And then Shotzi accidentally reverses and runs over her teammates, forcing her to go into war games by herself. Fear in the eyes of Shotzi. I don't know what Dakota Kai was so worried about. She was protected from Shotzi's missile by the cage. Hell, I would have said, is that all you got, bitch? Ember Moon is an asshole. She clearly nodded in agreement when Shotzi Blackheart declared that she will be starting the match, but then she changes her mind at the last second and says, nah, I got this. Also, three out of four agreed that Shotzi would start the War Games match, so she wins and you lose, Ember. Get back into the shark cage. But we are underway. It is time for War Games. Ember Moon actually falls for the cross both sets of ring ropes to come after the bad guy trick that works from almost no one in any War Games match. All this trick in the book. This matchup. Well, I'll tell you what, Ember. We're only a minute into this match and Ember has already performed an impressive head scissors counter to Dakota. You gotta have perfect time to do that, and she got it. Dakota Kai answered right back, Ember Moon. What? Ember's feet barely even touched Dakota, who also grabbed them to counter. Yet somehow Dakota was taken down by that. Again, both the You know, if you're not gonna keep the clock on the screen, then don't even bother to show it until we're 15 seconds away from the next entry. Of Team Blackheart to enter the front. That's it, I'm coming after you, Ember. Nobody goes first before me. A crowbar and a hit. Vic Joseph is actually having a hard time figuring out if the obvious toolbox shots he threw into the ring is a toolbox. Uh, a retribution revenge here. 
Beth Phoenix begins to say retribution, but then remembered that the word retribution signals the arrival of that stable, so she quickly switched it to revenge. The guy gingerly getting... How funny would it be if Raquel Gonzalez, in the heat of the moment, forgot that Dakota Kai was actually on her team and attacked her? I wouldn't be surprised since Dakota has a history of backstabbing teammates in War Games matches. Dakota Kai jumping from... <laughs> Both Shotzi and Ember were watching Dakota for a long time and could have countered or moved out of the way Samoa Joe style at any moment. Understandable that Dakota would go after Rhea Ripley as well, but damn, I wanted to see Raquel and Rhea go at it for a while on their own. Dakota could handle the remaining women in the other ring. Isolating and neutralizing! Shotzi Blackheart hasn't realized that you can't pin your opponent this early in a War Games match. God damn it, Shotzi, you forgot to give me the lock combination to this toolbox. Oh yeah, sorry Rhea, the combination is 86-40-12. This cannot be legal. Relax, Wade Barrett, this isn't a Hell in a Cell match. It's not going to end because of a sledgehammer shot. Tony Storm going under the ring. Tony Storm brings in a shitload of kendo sticks, but doesn't even use a single one of them upon entering the cage. First scene before, be a cow Raquel Gonzalez hit Shotzi Blackheart with a freaking crowbar, and Shotzi didn't even flinch upon getting hit. You didn't think I noticed, did you? This could be bad. You can clearly hear someone say, ready, one, two, three, before the women attempted the synchronized landing. Realize it. Wait a minute! Raquel actually believes that holding the door shut would keep Io Shirai from entering. You're an idiot. Io Shirai again, not able to enter this matchup. Actually, she could. Raquel merely closed the door and nothing's keeping Io Shirai from entering. Body straight oh you know, if Io Shirai would stop wasting time gathering weapons, she wouldn't end up getting locked out later on when Candice LeRae enters. That's gotta suck when Raquel Gonzalez, Candice LeRae, and even Indy Hartwell do everything they can to keep Io Shirai out of the match and fail miserably. Also, there's a major flaw in Team Candice's plan. Their goal is to keep Io Shirai out of the cage so that they can have a 4-on-3 advantage over Team Shotzi. But the problem with that is every wrestler needs to be present in the cage in order for a pin for submission to occur. So unless their plan was to keep the match going on forever, they're dumbass idiots. There are referees in the ring despite the fact that War Games has yet to officially begin. Out of the cage for now. Yep, that confirmed my suspicion that Team Candace were a bunch of dumbass idiots by believing they could win the match without all wrestlers present. Oh, oh, Alright, that was pretty innovative on the part of Yosha Rai. Trash can cross body onto the rest of the competitors. Here's a few sins off. And Shirai goes up, goes around, Rhea Ripley looking for the beat. Amazing double team moves from Rhea and Io. This is an excellent opening to War Games. Begging for mercy. Shotzi just lets Candace go get a weapon. If I were her, I'd take advantage of whack Candace with a chair I'm holding. Fair game. It's Shotzi Candace LeRae figures a kendo stick in combat against the steel chair. And that's all that needs to be said. Pretty brutal stomp out of the garbage can, but now Io is stuck inside and can't be pinned by Dakota. That one moment when the worst thing that could happen to Io ends up being the thing that saves her from being pinned. Hook of the leg! There's a literal pinfall going on in the ring, but let's focus on Shotzi watching it take place from her position instead. Looking at Dakota Kai! Oh! Yeah. Holy shit, that eclipse on the chairs had me cringing in pain. That was freaking awesome. Here are three more sins removed for that. Jeez. Blackheart looking down on the- Candice LeRae grabs a chair in hopes of protecting herself against Shotzi Blackheart, not realizing she could simply move out of the way. Instead, she sealed her fate. No, 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 no! Oh! The powerbomb through the ladder on the bridge connecting the rings was a hell of a brutal ending to this great match. Pat McAfee has not been quite- Pat McAfee throws his car keys to the cameraman as if he actually thought the cameraman would catch them. He's not your chauffeur, you dumbass. Well, this match is brought to you by WWE- Sorry, but even when you present your advertisements during the matches, I still gotta say skip! Timothy Thatcher should really have ring awareness when it comes to positioning given how he's lying against the ropes. Champ was talking about it before, you know, when he- Hey, dumbass referee, Tommaso Ciampa has his feet on the ropes. Looks like Timothy Thatcher isn't the only one who isn't aware of the ropes in this match. They must be invisible to them. And, and Tommaso... Even from a distance, I can see Tommaso Ciampa biting Timothy Thatcher. So the biting sin activates. I see everything. Better for the most part, Ciampa puts on the brake. Oh. These two made it look like they whacked heads even though their heads were so far off from each other. Gotta do better than that, guys. Sorry. Four games. Surprise Ciampa's even on his feet, but some... Alright, the sequence of Tommaso giving Timothy a clothesline every time he runs the ropes was fun to watch. That had me smiling, I'll admit that. Look at Ciampa able to kick off that middle turnbuckle! Tommaso Ciampa was clearly kicking away from the middle rope, not the turnbuckle. What match are you watching, Vic? Thatcher! I'll give Tommaso props for that brutal ending. That second rope DDT literally planted Timothy Thatcher. Second match in a row tonight where I cringed in pain. Loving this pay-per-view so far. 
Oh, but I did not just jinx that. Post-match, this is not over yet, stare down. Dexter Loomis' video on Cameron Grimes was honestly funny to watch. Seeing how Cameron is scared of Dexter, this is some fun entertainment. Generally a very grounded superstar. Honestly, since the ramp is exactly level with the first wrestling ring, why aren't all the non-war games matches present in that ring? Dexter, Loomis, and his trans probably thought, do I seriously have to walk all the way around one ring just to get into another? Jeez, that is one pissed off looking referee. Line the hell up, dude. War games is presented by nope, skip again. I can do this all night if I have to. How about Cameron Grimes and the referee stop arguing about who gets to use what strap and just put a strap on already? <laughs> okay, that just sounded so wrong right there. Oh my god, I'm an idiot. This strap match has taken all night to start strapping. We're gonna be here for a while, so strap in, I suppose. And of course, a pre-match assault. An assault that feels like it lasts almost longer than the actual match itself. I can't be the only one cringing in pain because Cameron's exposed leg is literally being sliced into by the sharp spikes at the top of the fence, right? In an attempt to escape from Dexter, he ends up being an idiot. Dexter uh -oh. We interrupt NXT TakeOver War Games 4 to bring you any movie scene where the monster slowly reveals its hands first before revealing its face as it hunt down its victim. I've seen that a lot. Wait. Cameron Grimes takes inspiration from Roman Reigns turning an I Quit Hell in a Cell match into a strap match by turning this match into a blindfold strap match. A little less impressive though. In this strap match, and oh! The innovation from Cameron Grimes in that moment was actually pretty good. I'll give him that one. Beth, listen to this. Do I have to? Uh, yeah. Beth, you're one of the commentators for this pay-per-view, so obviously you've got to listen to the impacts. Cameron Grimes is an idiot by sitting down and taking his time, allowing Dexter Loomis to recover and win the match. Post-match cradling. That is just creepy and weird. Pat McAfee, Danny Burch, and Oni Larkin are pumped up and ready for their War Games match. Meanwhile, Pete Dunne has the I really wish I weren't here right now face. Or it could be the why did I choose to hang with all these idiots face. You're not a real champion. You're a joke. Johnny Gargano to his mirror reflection. Plus, after the controversial way you won from Damian Priest that Halloween Havoc, you're one to talk about joke of a champion. Damn, Damian Priest didn't have enough time to perform his entrance and ended up arriving halfway through the promo video. That's a shame, he's got a kick-ass entrance. Match begins and Johnny Gargano's first act is to use Leon Ruff as a human shield against Damian Priest. Man, what has happened to this guy? Through a combination of luck and One thing that's a little irritating is Damian Priest not taking Leon Ruff seriously or treating him like a child by protecting him from harm. Just because he's the smallest competitor and the rookie doesn't mean you should take him lightly. And no, that wasn't a pun to his size either. The fact that Damien has to give Leon a last warning in this title match, a title which Leon currently holds and would like to keep. Oh! I don't know what's funnier, Damien tossing Leon through the barricade or that random security woman in the background knocking over a second barricade. Also, this single move is enough to put Leon out of the match temporarily. It wasn't even that brutal to be perfectly honest. It's a one on one match! Well, and ah, you failed. Here is your job. Did Beth Phoenix just refer to him as Johnny Gano? Is Vince McMahon shortening names by cutting them in half or something? I'm just waiting for Damie Priest now. NXT TakeOver Warrior. Wow, impressive corkscrew cutter from Leon Ruff. This kid definitely has talent. Should have held on to that title so that he could perform more. And I'm pretty sure tying up Damien Priest on the ropes is not going to keep him from being involved in this triple threat match. What is this supposed to be? Ghostface Retribution or something? Haven't we seen enough of these stables in 2020? I get that Damian Priest is pumped up from Attack of the Ghostface Army, but there's still a North American title match going on. Now's not the time to give a menacing stare to the camera. So, what was the point of this? The point of getting this random Leon Ruff guy to be the North American champion for like three weeks, all just so Johnny Gargano could win it back after being dethroned in a two week reign? Congrats, you're a three time champion. Now, what's the point of this? Ha! Ah, get it? It's me, Austin. It was me all along. That's a funny yet cringe reference to one of the most frustrating reveals in WWE history. Can we just refer to the NXT War Games match as the Undisputed Era match by this point? The fans are definitely going to feel different if the War Games pay-per-view continues without them. In the fields of body. Black Sabbath, man. Black Sabbath. Only one song is appropriate for this event. War Pigs! Since WWE loves to use crowd sound effects, it'd be much appreciated if we got a louder boom for the Undisputed Era's music. 
I'm sure it's a good way to ground Pete Dunne, but I hope Kyle O'Reilly doesn't expect to submit Pete literally minutes into the beginning of the War Games match. O'Reilly having to hold on for just a Seems to me that Team McAfee forgot to devise a strategy on who should exit with each interval, given Oni Lorcan telling Pat McAfee to take a back seat, basically. Might be two on one. All swarmed in oh, I'm impressed with Kyle O'Reilly in the early minutes of this War Games match, given how he managed to trap both Pete Dunne and Oni Lorcan on his own. This guy's got, hopefully, a great singles career coming ahead. Jeez, another sin off! That's like a combination of the Kimura Lock and Pete's Bending the Fingers move. On second thought, I'm guessing that the rest of Pat's team simply doesn't like him and are being dicks on purpose. In some ways, I can't blame them for that. These two tag teams surely hate each other! Thanks for stating the obvious, Beth. Well, that's what you get for constantly monologuing and wasting valuable time instead of actually using the cricket bat to your advantage. Danny Birch is a dumbass. Boy, this is awkward. Roderick Strong is full of creativity in this match, no doubt. It's as if each member of the Undisputed Era showcased a new styles of creativity with each War Games pay-per-view that passes. Kudos to them. Strong can feel the energy in the Sorry, we don't want you to see the full brutality of Roderick Strong hitting the cage because it'd be too hard to watch. Match ever, and, it's gonna happen. and then little Jimmy tells Pat McAfee to wait another interval because he wants to turn to the War Games match. I've never heard tables been booed before. The crowd aren't booing the tables, you dumbass. They're booing Pat McAfee. Why would they boo something they usually chant that they want? Also, funny enough, Pat McAfee labels each table with the Undisputed Era's members' names, and yet most of the members don't crash to their respective names. Also, also, how awkward would it be if the Undisputed Era chose to bring the tables into the cage and discover the graffiti themselves? You mean to tell me that Team McAfee was watching Adam Cole even before he grabbed a fire extinguisher and somehow didn't realize that he had a fire extinguisher? Oh no, this gives me a very bad feeling. Adam just shouted, I'm Adam Cole, but did not shout Bay Bay afterwards. I'm sorry guys, but it looks like WWE just might tell Adam to not use that anymore. Don't you dare. If there's anything you do not touch, it's the sacred baby. Pat McAfee actually falls for this. Now this is excitement right here. A brawl in one ring with each member of one team fighting each member of the other team. Very typical. You're not Ric Flair. This scene is actually an amazing shot. Adam Cole reverses the figure for a leg lock, so Pat McAfee is the one in pain. Meanwhile, the rest of the Undisputed Era have Pat's teams trapped in submissions on the other side to prevent them from interfering. Up and through the- Haha, the table didn't break. Although I'm questioning how the hell it didn't break. There's already Danny Burch lying on the table, then you got Pete Dunne who was double teamed into him, and their combined weight and momentum somehow didn't break the table. Since that table was marked with Adam Cole's name, he should have at least been the one to put Pete and Danny through it. Just saying, it made more sense. This is the War Games matchup. No shit, Sherlock. I get that Pat McAfee is new here, but I'm sure even he knows that if you escape the cage in a War Games match, you automatically lose. Well, the Undisputed Era probably shouldn't have wasted all that time having fun with Pat McAfee. If I were them, I would have finished him off so that we could win. God, you could literally feel that on your own spine without even taking the suplex on the metal floor to know how much brutality it holds. Oh, no! Pat McAfee is a dick to Adam's calls. Bebe. Seriously? I added an S for each of the names for fuck's sakes. All eight of these guys deserve the praise after this extremely epic War Games match, so here are 15 sins removed from the counter. NXT continues to shine with great action. What are the odds that they immediately moved on because they couldn't find a suitable R word that went to the beat of We Are NXT? Also, welcome to the first ever NXT 2.0 sins, I guess. Pros include a chance to see and see new wrestlers competing. Cons including the big question why they couldn't at least keep the same colors as the previous NXT. Format, totally cool. The Nickelodeon colors, not so much. Also, also, I get not adding in the TakeOver name to the 2.0 pay-per-views, but tonight honestly would have been the most appropriate time to put it in, since the wrestlers of the 2.0 era are here to take over what the wrestlers of 1.0 used to dominate. 1.0, 2.0. 
Technically, NXT 1.0 would have been that terrible competition show introduced in 2010, which would mean that 2.0 is actually Tommaso Ciampa and his team. So the revamp of NXT should actually be NXT 3.0. It's had as many remakes as live-action adaptations of Spider-Man. I'm not kidding, for an NXT War Games pay-per-view, they actually overuse the siren sound effects. I believe the amount of times is either five or six, which is about the same number of Hell in a Cell matches that took place in 2021 as well. We know it's your last night. At this point, everyone is having a last night around this place. I'm sorry, but can you please turn off the siren? The cage is already surrounding the ring for the opening match. The siren is put in place when the cage is descending. And I love how they got the cage to descend last year in the Performance Center. It was awesome. Welcome to your first pay-per-view, Cora Jade. First thing that happens is she skateboards into the arena and immediately falls off it. Kaylee Ray pulling a discount sting in her first War Games match during her entrance. Anyone else notice the way she moved the baseball bat? Dakota Kai's appearances is getting weirder and weirder with every entrance. I can't be the only one who preferred her previous looks during her heel run, right? Dakota Kai pulls out a load of kendo sticks, but proceeds to wield only one of them. Since Kaylee Ray has a baseball bat, it'd be a lot smarter if Dakota wielded two kendo sticks, one in each hand, just to be safe. Also, I don't mean to sound stupid, and proceed to call me stupid if I am for pointing this out, but why are the shark cages containing the other wrestlers in the crowd who are supposed to be wearing masks during the COVID-19 pandemic? One of those things is a little redundant, if I'm being honest. Shark cage cam. It's quite simple, fool. Dakota Kai actually believed that Kaylee Ray would graciously welcome her to the second ring and not take advantage with her baseball bat. Dakota's not really bright at all, is she? Admire the creativity here, but one single Irish whip onto the ropes and that kendo stick bridge will tumble down easily. Dakota Kai had the baseball bat in her hand, and Kaylee Ray had to leap to a different ring just to reach her. So why didn't Dakota take advantage and swing the baseball bat? This is right up. See what I mean about the kendo stick bridge? These women barely touched the ropes, and one of the sticks have already tumbled. Jade, innovative right here. Beth Phoenix says this just as Cora Jade weakly tosses the skateboard away when she could have aimed lower to stop Dakota Kai on her tracks. Damn. It's an alternating member from each. To this day, I still don't get why a wrestler grabs their opponent's foot, but then proceeds to taunt them instead of tripping them or pushing them back. It's as if the existence of the Enziguri suddenly disappears from their memory when that moment happens. Can't believe I would say this, but wrestlers exit in the shark cage just to pull weapons like garbage cans and kendo sticks have been overused in war games matches. It's not even that exciting anymore. Matter of fact, nobody reacts with intense electricity when so much as a table is introduced into this match. Yeah, but the it's question is what's in the bag. The commentators wonder what's in the bag that Gigi Dolan brings into the cage. And you know what the sad part is? It's just an empty duffel bag. There's literally nothing in it. And if there wasn't anything inside, why did Gigi even bring it into the cage? They could have at least put Legos in there? Oh! Ow, my hands! You really can't go. Dakota Kai did a good job connecting her kick to Kaylee Ray. Meanwhile, Gigi Dolan missed Corey J completely on her end. We have gone through two full countdowns without anything exciting going on. I get that in the rules of war games, the match doesn't officially begin until everybody's in the ring, but there should still at least be some excitement leading up to the official start, as we have seen in recent years since 2017. In the history of NXT War Games, garbage cans and kendo sticks are the most common weapons used. If they're going to keep doing future War Games matches, they should really consider upgrading their weapon availability. No risk, she will not what the hell was Io Shirai thinking? For someone who's been in every single women's War Games match, she's really showing a lot of rookie mistakes. Lifting up a garbage can so that everyone can see instead of actually doing something with said garbage can. Side the War Games. Let's be honest, that move was always going to fail no matter who connected it or how. When you have little to no space to move around in between two rings, you're gonna fuck it up. Cora Jade practically got power bomb into the metal beam connecting the rings, and yet somehow she's not damaged at all. The worst time to chant we want tables is when there are tables already getting introduced. Chant's a little redundant when you're already getting what you wanted. Absolutely, it's tag team champions. The Hurricane Rana was well done, but Cora Jade randomly threw herself into the cage in a direction she was not heading. I bet even Gigi Dolan was confused on why she did that. NXT Universe. What is this, Adam Cole and the Young Bucks in AEW? And then Io Shirai accidentally hooks her feet against the cage, causing her to get stuck upside down. How about instead of closing in on JC Jane and taunting her, Io and her team actually grab her and put her through the table? Just a suggestion. Cora Jade was impressive right there on the swanton bomb off the top of the cage. It's a shame she injures her shoulder and is out for pretty much the remaining 15 minutes, but I'll still give credit where credit is due. I got 
Rather than allowing medical professionals to help Cora deal with her dislocated shoulder, Io Shirai tells him to screw off so that she could pop it back in herself and allow toxic attraction to go after the injury later on. <laughs> Obviously, this wasn't a legitimate shoulder dislocation, but Cora was a little late on the reaction of Eel popping it back into place. Don't we have enough garbage cans in the ring already? Pull out a toolbox or maybe a ladder or something. Who the hell put a shovel underneath the ring? I'm just trying to imagine the workers who set up the ring thinking, you know what would be funny? What if I put the shovel underneath the ring to see if it'll get used in either of the War Games matches tonight? And another dude is like, Riddle gave you another stash of weed, didn't he? Does not want to feel the Dakota Kai does realize that this match cannot officially start until everyone is in the ring. That always bothered me about these matches. Why do wrestlers do that when they know they can't win in that way? <laughs> Missed opportunity for Raquel Gonzalez to place a second trash can over Dakota Kai, covering her completely, and then whacking it with a steel chair. That could have gotten a sin or two removed for the creativity. But alas, all that happens here is Dakota goes for a small ride. <laughs> Well, that was a fail since the garbage can is in the same shape and condition it was in earlier before Yo Shirai connected the moonsault, which also missed. Ceiling cam. As the leader of team Surprise Mandy Rose didn't add five more garbage cans to the match since everyone else thought there was a shortage of them. And that right there is why Yo Shirai was a dick earlier for not letting Cora get checked out by the actual doctors. Nice try, but I wasn't believing for a second that Kaylee Ray was about to turn heel on her team because nobody actually teases it and then does it. No way! Ugh. Mandy Rose is like, must prevent cool moment from happening. I want more sins added to this pay-per-view. Well, wish granted. Shoulders at you. Oh, that's it? Wow, not gonna lie, that took me off guard because it has been over a minute since JC was hit by Raquel's signature powerbomb. Still think it's awesome that Cora got the win for her team, but they could have done it a little better. Over five minutes of commercials and promos for from upcoming NXT 2.0 wrestlers. And this is actually a recurrent thing throughout the night in between matches, just so we can reach the three-hour mark to show we're serious. If you look closely, you can actually see Fabian Eichner trying his best not to laugh because Marcel Bartel has his NXT Tag Team Championship belt upside down around his waist. I guess he's the TXN Tag Team Champion? Wonder what that stands for. Who gives a shit about Hula- I mean, DraftKings! Sorry, whenever a green advertisement appears at the bottom of the screen, my Hulu instincts kick in. Who's to say he can't do it again tonight? His ending contract probably doesn't think Kyle O'Reilly will win the tag team titles with Von Wagner. Got a lot of potential. Kyle O'Reilly dropped Fabian Eichner before Von Wagner could knock him over, making the only thing impressive be the game of leapfrog they played. Zion Quinn came down to ringside. Look, I get that Wade Barrett is entertaining on commentary, but could we at least talk about what's going on in the ring right now? We can get back to arguing later in between matches. O'Reilly, no! Yikes! Kyle O'Reilly whacked Marcel Bartel in the face so hard he made him think he was Scott Hall posing in the NWO for a second. Is Marcel auditioning to join the Bloodline on the very case Imperium doesn't work out? Interesting theory. The universe split between these two. You could clearly see Marcel prepare to leap over the top rope before Kyle could even kick him out. Wagner, changing it. Because they didn't turn around in time, Marcel had to jump twice in the air as if they were on a trampoline in order to get choke slammed onto Fabian. Same page. Live footage of Fabian Eichner and Kyle O'Reilly stumbling out of a bar after many shots of vodka somehow made its way into this pay-per-view event. Well, holy shit, that was awesome to look at. Fabian almost missed Vaughn completely, and that would have been catastrophic for him. Good work on the part of both wrestlers for that risk-taking moment. Really stepped up. Oh, what? It may be a post-match assault sin, but you also gotta admire the callback to Adam Cole turning on Kyle O'Reilly coming back to haunt him. Only this time, Kyle was ready for it. We are la familia. Actually, that stable has previously existed in WWE and is no longer around, but still, that name is taken. You bluff me in poker! Time to make this a hair versus hair match! Wait, what? That's how this whole thing came to be? By outsmarting him and then got out Did anyone notice how Cameron Grimes was nearly sent into the other ring, but then quickly moved in the opposite direction? Does this confirm my question on wrestlers getting disqualified if they enter the second ring? Did you say a bold... Wade Bearer doesn't even care that Cameron Grimes flew Triple H style over the top rope and dangerously crashed onto the stairs. More interested in what Beth Phoenix said. Well, referee at seven is... Not even Vic Joseph is paying attention to this match, as he claimed the referee was at a 7 count when he was actually at an 8 count. Is Beth the only one left who's paying attention? Cameron, slowest count I've ever heard. Sorry, but Wade Barrett is so annoying tonight. That was, in no way, the slowest count out ever. If anything, it was a little faster than a normal count out. 
Duke Hudson is honestly making a huge mistake by shouting that to Cameron Grimes. Rather than yell about what you're going to do, how about you win the match first? To be bold, here to After all these decades, I refuse to believe that anyone could ever fall for the Enziguri counter by accident. Oh, the covers, Grimes. Cameron should consider himself lucky that his shoulders weren't down as well. If they both lost, would that mean they both lose their hair? Boy, I got a lot of questions about this type of match. Referee. Wade Barrett deserves five sins for thinking that the referee's pathetic for properly doing his job and stopping a count when wrestlers are grabbing the ropes for leverage. If you're going to be a bad guy on the commentary, at least don't sound like you don't know how refereeing and wrestling matches work. Six the same size. Oh. Well, damn, here's a double center mover for that perfectly done reverse Rana. Amazing. <laughs> Victory by means of grasping the tights is always a sin, even when it's the good guys doing it. Now Wade has a valid complaint about the referee. We interrupt NXT War Games 2021 to bring you Over the Limit 2010. Only reason I'm saying that is because a shitload of hair was left on Duke's head just like CM Punk. Should have strapped him to the chair like Donald Trump did to Vince McMahon at WrestleMania in 2007. The moment someone who's well over 205 pounds is challenging for the Cruiserweight Championship, that's the moment when the title has lost all credibility and will likely be retired for the second time. Such a shame how WWE messed up this championship. I really wish all the years were like 2016. Also, this whole thing confuses me. So, Roderick Strong is a heel and Joe Gacy is a face, right? Or do I got it wrong and Roderick is the face while Joe is the heel? Feels like they keep switching. Four games, which is presented by... Skip! Is Joe Gacy trying to ask Roderick Strong to hug it out with him? Oh god, are we seeing the next team help? Let me just stop. Seriously? Begging for mercy from a simple shove to the ground at the start of the match? What the hell has happened to NXT? A majority of this eight-minute match is Joe Gacy begging Roderick Strong for mercy, trying to hug him, and a few other random things. For the last pay-per-view of 2021, not to mention the first NXT 2.0 pay-per-view, I've been cringing in almost every match that wasn't a War Games match. Look at Strong. Oh! Fucking what? Harlan sneaking up behind Ivy Nile and lifting her up is honestly the only entertaining part of this match. I would remove a sin, but nothing comes from it other than Joe losing to Roderick. The entire existence of this segment, which included so much binge eating of junk food, not to mention fucking toilet humor. We had to literally watch this guy's shit on a wrestling pay-per-view. Nobody thinks that shit is funny. Neither does the 100,000 sins I just snapped for this event. <laughs> I am so annoyed with this alarm that you can literally replace it with my pillow screaming for next year's War Games event, assuming there's even going to be one next year. Team 2.0 rise to the occasion. Most likely considering this is the first NXT 2.0 pay-per-view and we gotta make sure that 2.0 stars are the shining ones. Spoiler alert. Also, man, this just feels weird. And no, not because this is the fifth War Games event for NXT, but the first that doesn't involve the Undisputed Era. But why is LA Knight part of the NXT Black and Gold team when he literally debuted as it ended? They could have asked someone like Finn Balor to make a cameo or something. You know, I thought at first they forgot to turn off the War Games alarm, then realized they'd begun Braun Breaker's entrance theme. Good lord, I've never been so annoyed at alarms. It appears Carmelo Hayes is gonna start. Vic Joseph guessed that Carmelo Hayes was starting this War Games match just by watching him enter the cage. I figured that out because he was the last guy to make his entrance while the rest of the team went up to the shark cages. Everyone knows I'm not the biggest fan of Johnny Gargano and had a running gag of calling him Johnny Failure for years. But damn it, I can't resist removing five cents for the return of his Rebel Heart theme. Not to mention the custom outfit featuring pieces of his outfits used on previous NXT TakeOver events. It's been a fun ride, Johnny. No one cares what's trending. The main event just started. Gonna have five minutes. What happens after that five minutes? Vic Joseph literally said that there's five minutes before the next wrestler will be released into the War Games match, then proceeds to ask what happens after five minutes. What an idiot. Starting off pretty good. Gotta love the dozens of counters from both Johnny Gargano and Carmelo Hayes. That was fun. This cage is absolutely shaking. That might be because the crew forgot to tighten some of the bolts together to keep it stable. Here's the hoping it doesn't collapse. This is trouble. Well, holy shit. Here's another center move. We're only in the first five minutes, and I'm already loving everything about this War Games match. Excellent start. Respect of the NXT universe and the... Damn, Grayson Waller hit Johnny Gargano in the face so hard it temporarily turned him into Christian. This feels like a mistake on the part of Team 2.0 because they have the two-on-one advantage on Johnny Gargano for the time being. The clock is ticking, and they are not taking advantage of the opportunity. Just standing around, waiting for him to get back to his feet. Come on, Trick Williams nearly killed Grayson Waller. I don't know whether I should send him for that or send Grayson for not heeding Trick's watch-out warning. 
Goes to show that Pete Dunne is very creative when it comes to bending fingers in the War Games cage. My god, that looks extremely painful to watch. Um, who's gonna tell these guys that the match cannot end yet because there are still wrestlers in the shark cages? Any volunteers? Tony D'Angelo enters the War Games cage and then demands that Trick Williams bring in more weapons, including kendo sticks and tables. Why didn't this asshole just do that in the first place before he entered the damn cage? <laughs> If Dexter Loomis was underneath that ring the entire time, why didn't he stop Trick from pulling out weapons 15 minutes ago? Here we go once again with someone trying to lock certain wrestlers out of the cage by means of a chain. It's smart to keep your opponents out, but dumb if you want to win the match as it can't end until everyone is inside. Haha, <laughs> -ha, LA Knight failed to catch the trash can lid. How ironic that it's Braun Breaker who destroys the chain after his partner Tony D'Angelo was the one who locked it to keep Team Black and Gold out. Further made that stun even more pointless when your own partner foils your plan. NXT, the last person. It's weird how Grayson Waller had a better opportunity to whack Tommaso Ciampa with a kendo stick the moment Tommaso's foot got stuck on the ropes like Dave Batista at WrestleMania 35 but chose to wait. <laughs> Alright, I gotta admit this was an amazing shot. Very appropriate how we are witnessing Team Black and Gold in between the two rings surrounded by Team 2.0 as a representation of how things have drastically changed in NXT. And I'm not entirely against it because it's a love letter to the previous NXT and a glimpse into the future at the same time. Pass it at the torch moment. Grayson Waller! Absolutely badass table spot. Holy shit, Grayson nearly landed on his head too. This is a fantastic main event. I don't think this pinfall should count considering Braun's shoulders are off the canvas and on the trash can. Unless I got it wrong and the trash can is a legal participant somehow. Ew. Let's be honest, 5 sins ain't enough this time. Let's remove 20 sins for an extremely chaotic ending to this epic War Games match. We may not be in the TakeOver era anymore, but at least the matches are still as fun as we remember.